welcome once again to Inside the Magic Circle. I'm Jason Augustus Newcomb, and I am talking today with someone who I'm really looking forward to speaking with because he has a very interesting perspective on magic that is not all that different from my own, I think, but we're going to find out in this interview. Um, I'm, I'm speaking today to Patrick Dunn. He's the author of quite a number of books at this point, from postmodern magic to the practical art of divine magic. He's got a translation of the Orphic hymns that, I, I, that I'm hoping that we can talk about at least a little bit. And uh, he's also got a couple others. Uh, what, what, am I, what am I skipping? Oh, uh, um, what is it? Magic, Power, Language, Symbol, and a book on uh, Lenormand and Cardomancy. Um, am I saying Lenormand right? How, how do you? Lenormand. It's French. So they Lenormand. Say. Lenormand. I'll, I'll probably say it wrong again because um, <laughs> it's easy for me to do that. Um, Every, everyone has their own way of pronouncing it. <laughs> as this is something I just talked to Sarah Mastros a, 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 a couple of weeks ago, and, and this is an issue I think in the magical community in general because we uh, were a very literate community uh, who often don't speak to each other in uh, out loud a lot. So we, there's a lot of varying pronunciations of a number of different things. She, um, she, she was telling me about her incense and she called it kaifi. And I thought, that's really fascinating because that's, I've, I've heard it said in a bunch of different ways, but not that particular way. Um, <laughs> so, how, uh, how do you say it? What? How do you say it? Um, I, I generally say kifi. Or oh, Kiffy. Those okay. are the two that I've heard people say I think most. I've always said Kiffy too. So Sarah and I are on Interesting. Same, we often are on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> right? Without even realizing it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when we talked, we talked a little bit about your, um, your, your translation of the Orphic Hymns and that you guys basically were doing the project at essentially the same time. Although I think you were working on it longer than she was um, before, it, before it came up, but they, they finished at the same time. And you guys were both very cool about the whole thing. Yeah, it was, well, my, my first reaction when I saw it was coming out was my heart sank a little bit, but, you know, then I talked to Sarah, and we, we have such different approaches to it. It's true. That they're, yeah, they're I, really complementary books. I mean, you can own both and get more out of both just by owning both. So. Right, and and what, what she brings to the table, she brings a lot more sort of mythology and stuff along the way with, with what she did, and what you bring more to the table is a little bit more systematization. You feel like you've, you've kind of You've got charts in there that she doesn't have, and you've got sort of like um, some some suggestions on on ways of applying them that she doesn't have. Although she has a, a number of practical things in there, but they're more just sort of like inspired practical things. Whereas you're kind of creating not a system, but you're you know you offer a few kind of tips on on applying. So I really feel like they are quite complementary to each other. And I think if if you're a person who like me would probably not want to use either of them exactly. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a great possibility of you know looking at Thomas Taylor, looking at um, the Greek guy whose name I don't want to murder, and looking at yours and looking at looking at hers, and and then you know sort of triangulating or qua quaternating or whatever to to get the uh, well, and, and Taylor's actually included in here. Uh, yes, I, I know. Yeah, it's great, and and um, it's it it's it's a nice sort of counterpoint to what you've done as well because he's so i mean he's so poetical in the way that he that he approaches it and you're and you're so not literal but sort of to the point um getting the actual language um translated in, in your version of it which i think is really valuable but still maintaining a, a magical flavor to it and not getting too academic and sounding if you get too literal you end up with with nonsense because right many of the, the hymns don't, you don't get to a verb until the last line because Greek can do that. It can just go on with participles forever. If you try to do that in English, it's just, it's incoherent. So <laughs> you have to turn some of those participles into verbs from time to time. Also this has the, the uh, uh, facing page Greek as well. So right, which, which makes it nice yeah. for, for those who like to write things out in Greek. Now you and I started talking a couple months ago because I was questioning um, a, a, a word uh, that, that you had in your Greek slightly differently than, than I'd seen it online. What what version of the text did you utilize as sort of your, you know, main Greek version? So uh, I, I utilized the, the quant uh, edition, which is the standard edition. And so okay. that's, we, we paid for the rights to use that, that edition. But um, I also consulted um, uh, Morant, what, what's her first name? Um, I can't remember her first name now, but let's see if I can find my bibliography. Well, you're saying that, uh, do you, did you notice that there were a lot of um, variants in, in these different versions or no? 
There are, but but um, there's not that many. Uh, but but uh, quant the quant edition sort of um, um, smooths them out mm. and has footnotes. And so usually I just took the the most uh, reasonable, um, uh, you know, translation. Uh, en France, en France, Moran. So her Etude uh, sur le Im Orphique, um, in that she talks about a few variant readings that she thinks are more likely than in, in, the, in the standard edition. And so when I agreed with her, I included those as the, the variants. So did you edit the Greek text or did you just use that in translation? I edited the Greek text and usually with a note saying that I'm just, and, and I didn't do that very often, but once in a while she had something where I looked at the original, I was like, yeah, that looks like it's more likely for various reasons. So it's a, a weird form that wouldn't exist in that location grammatically, and then she corrects it. And so I kind of went with that. I'm going to backtrack into the distant past and, and how your magical journey began in a second, but I, I just have one more question about this, um, which is uh, you, the the language uh, of of the, the Orphic hymns, it, it's, a, a certain form of, of Greek, a more formal version, is that correct? It's interesting because it was probably written in late antiquity when most people were running around speaking Koine, but mm -hmm. actually written in uh, Homeric Greek, which is a sort of an artificial dialect that, that you know, Homer is written in, hence the name Homeric, or Apic Greek, it's sometimes called that. Hesiod writes in it, um, um, the, or, oh, uh, the Orphic, or the Homeric hymns are written in it. That's why they're called Homeric hymns. Homer had nothing to do with them, but they're written in his dialect. And so it's written in that dialect as sort of like an imitation of much older works. Um, and, so, and so that dialect, the purpose of it was just simply to, to seem more authoritative or you know, what was the reasoning behind it? It was pretty typical to use that dialect when you wrote poetry, uh, not, the, not universal. I mean, Sappho uses her own dialect, but pretty typical that if you wrote poetry, you're gonna to try to imitate Homer and you're gonna write in that dialect. And so pretty much every Greek educated Greek was bidialectical in their dialect and then also an epic. And so that 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 epic dialect that that was spoken at one point or or it wasn't utilized. It they might be based on a Bronze Age version of Greek. Um, we know we know that uh, Mycenaean Greek, for example, didn't use the definite article. And the definite article is used sparingly in hmm. epic Greek. Uh, it often just drops out, or it's often used as a pronoun instead of as an article. So I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that probably some Bronze Age version of Greek was the model. The dialect. Yeah, the model. And um, so uh, the, the, the Homeric uh, stories in general, are, are they written by a single person or is, that, is, that, or they, is it viewed as being sort of a, that too is a, a sort of a mythic uh, story? Um, I think the general consensus now is that they were probably stitched together from a number of oral stories. Um, but, and they were, they were probably originally oral, they, they probably weren't originally written down because we see uh, indications of oral poetry, like the repetition of certain formulas to fill out metrical units. That's why Athena is always the gray eyed goddess Athena, because to fit out the metrical line, you know, every time you mention Athena, if you stick gray eyed goddess there, now, now it fits that metrical line perfectly. And, and, so, and is, is that why those hymns are written that way? Because of the fact that the language supports the particular meter that they're creating in the poetry? Uh, that is uh, one theory. Um, that's the theory of Alfred Lord. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sold that that's the case. Um, we see something similar in, in oral poetry, kind of cross-culturally, where people use these sort of formulas. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, you see it, uh, Sanskrit is a good example of a similar. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So. And so Probably it was all written down and assigned to a Homer, but whether mm -hmm. Homer was one person, I kind of doubt that. I'm, I'm dubious it, of that. It, it seems like Plato was sold on the idea that he was a person, though. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a there's a, a sense of that in in the dialogues that you know he he comes up fairly frequently as a you know the the poet in. in oh, a absolutely, sense. absolutely, and I think you know that this idea that they might have been composed by. Uh, uh, a disparate group of people and then sort of sewn together, stitched together is relatively modern. I'd say uh, early 20th century is when that idea really took off. Okay, so now that we've bored people with a bunch of nerdiness, let's go back to your oh, magical journey. No, 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 I, 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 I think everyone loves that, so I'm just kidding. Oh, oh, so, uh, so let's go back. How, how did you become interested in magic? I know in your in your bio it says you've been doing magic since childhood, so. Yeah, since childhood. Um, I got 
Uh, I mean, I was very young when I got interested in magic. There was a, I grew up in a um, small town, Western uh, Illinois that had a Carnegie library, you know, uh, uh, Dale Carnegie donated a bunch of money to build these incredible libraries. They're like temples in the middle of tiny little towns <laughs> that aren't that important. And so we had a Carnegie library, it was enormous. And uh, they had a small but substantial occult section and um, mostly books that like, I don't remember the names of them at this point because I would have been like 12 or 13 when I'm reading mm -hmm. the book, you know. One was green, I remember that. And uh, I'd get those books and I'd read them and I thought, well, that's kind of intriguing. I mean, if, that, if that's possible, you know, and my mother was always into ESP and so forth, um, you know, um, so, you know, it was the 70s and 80s, so it was kind of- Like in the she era. was a part of an ESP research group or she just liked to read about it? She just kind of liked to read about it. Um, she participated in some workshops and stuff mm -hmm. uh, and got involved in some stuff. Um, but so, you know, I, I was open to the possibility and I kind of started trying things. I wouldn't say I had anything that I would say worked, uh, like I had any effects that I would notice from, from practicing stuff until probably about 16 or 17 when stuff actually started to work. And then I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is what's necessary for this to work. I have to be in a certain state of mind. I have to have a certain, you know. What, what is your definition of working? Like a, like a result well, in the world or a result in your consciousness? What, what do you mean by that? Oh, uh, well, in the world. Um, yeah, a result in the world. I mean, results in consciousness are great, but it's awfully easy to fool oneself, you know. But if you can actually cause a change in the world, especially an unlikely change. I mean, I remember one of my biggest successes as uh, I was 16, yeah, 16 years old, and I decided I wanted a job, which was, of course, a mistake because no one wants a job, but <laughs> money, I thought money might be nice. Um, fool. Uh, so I, uh, I made a talisman to get a job, and I told my mother I made a talisman to get a job you know, I'm carrying it around in my pocket for a couple of days. And she's like, well, you know, it's customary to actually look for a job if you want one. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't need to. I already did the magic. And uh, I got a phone call from a local pharmacy. Uh, the owner of the pharmacy said he was looking for someone to, to work part-time and that he had called the school and they had given them my number as a person who might want a job. And I hadn't told anyone at all. That, that, is, that seems like a very unlikely result. So it's, right. hard, and it's so, hard to argue with that. I mean, I hated the job with a red hot passion, <laughs> but uh, I worked there for a couple of years. And what, what did you do at the pharmacy? Oh, vacuuming, stocking shelves, checking people out, um, getting yelled at by the substitute pharmacist, stuff like that. <laughs> you know, the typical stuff a teenager does at a pharmacy. Uh, I did. I didn't particularly care for working retail, but I don't think I don't think I'm alone in that. I think there's yeah. I think it's it's the rare bird that says, you know, I love my retail job. <laughs> some people do though you know I, enjoy, yeah and more power to them. i'm not i'm certainly not casting aspersions on working retail because god knows we need people to work retail and uh, you know it just i didn't particularly i found it kind of boring but um, and so during that time period that you were working there your your mind was was racing thinking i got this job because i did a magic spell to get this job and so what was the next step from there well uh i got I mean, like many people, I picked up Donald Michael Craig's Modern Magic. Um, but unlike many people, I actually worked through it a month in lesson <laughs> and did everything that, that I was told to do. And, uh, um, you know, now I look back on it and I'm like, well, it's a, it's a pretty good introduction to one kind of magic. Mm -hmm. Not really the kind of magic I do anymore. Um, I'm not so into robes and circumambulations, but, um, but it, you know, I, I, could get, I could get effects. From that I could actually get things that worked from mm -hmm. that style of magic and then you know as as I uh aged as we all do um I, I started picking up things like um Libra Null and Psychonaut um you know the, the chaos magic stuff um, so uh Donald Michael Craig's book is very much a sort of golden dawn derived magical technique although he adds a few other things from various other little places but um so that, I mean, that, that has a, a, a sort of formalism to it, but uh, as we're growing as a magical community, we're realizing that that formalism is a little bit contrived. Um, mm -hmm. and, but so then you, you slipped into the, to the chaos magic sphere. Um, what, what, what did you pull from the golden dawn into, into chaos magic? Um, 
Well, I still found uh, the Kabbalah kind of an interesting framework to work with, but I started sort of paring it down to, uh, I wasn't so interested in, uh, you know, Jewish mysticism. I'm not Jewish. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit inappropriate for me to, to pretend I am, you know? Um, so I started paring it down to like, well, where was this stuff coming from? And, you know, one of, one of the assumptions of chaos magic that I, that I took away and kind of capped is uh, what would happen if instead of, you know, a system, you started from zero, you started with, I'm going to, I'm going to invent magic. Where would you start with that? And so I started thinking about, well, how, how are these systems constructed? What are they for? You know, they're for putting things in relationship to each other. They're for making symbolic links between each other. Right. And that kind of led me into actually studying sem semiotics and how symbols work, uh, which was a uh, probably more fruitful area to go into in the long run. And, and so that's actually where you went with your academic career, right? Do you... Well, yeah, I kind of ended up, um, I just ended up studying linguistics, but I ended up studying literature formally and then kind of got drawn into linguistics as one does um, because it is seductive. And, or at least it was for me. I, I just assume everyone is fascinated by language because <laughs> they are, right? They must be, they must be. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some people like to work in retail stores. Some people like to yeah, I guess books. so, yeah. And good for them. Some people too. like to do both. Some people like to read books while they're in retail stores. That was retail I did enjoy. I got to work in a bookstore for a while. And so that was that was a lot more fun. But in fact, it was an occult bookstore. So that got me uh, a lot of resources. And uh, at one point, I was just writing up the list of all the books they should order because I had read them all by then, you know. <laughs> knew what, were, what was good and what was nonsense and what sold and what didn't. I and so what, what in occult literature sort of, you know, lit a fire on you besides chaos, magic, and, and uh, Donald Michael Craig? Um, S-S-O-T-B-M-E. Um, okay, yeah, love that book. Very influential. Um, and I, I came to it late, actually. And I'm kind of glad I did because I got, you know, it's been through several editions and I got to a later edition that was a lot meatier than <laughs> the one that he adds. He adds a sub chapter to almost every chapter. With more yeah, of that's the yeah. version I have too. So that's a book by uh, Ramsey Dukes for anyone who's like wanting to collect Patrick Dunn's uh, occult library. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 what I find fascinating about and, and actually I, I, I see his influence in some of your uh, your writings. Uh, actually, now that I think about it, um, because he, 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 he likes to talk about how um, magic is about sort of looking at the world and finding the, the meaningful links in the world, as opposed to um, the, the other three uh, directions that, that he described. And I'm going to let people, you know, we don't need to talk about that. Honestly, but Okay, so, so Ramsey Dukes inspired you. And of course, Ramsey Dukes is considered to be one of the uh, sort of like godfathers of chaos magic. So we see that, that, that through line coming through here. So how did you get from that point to writing your first book, Postmodern Magic? What, what, what brought that about? Um, I was in an internet argument. Um, I was much argumentative and pugnacious back in 2005, and uh, I was in an internet argument, and someone said, well, if you, you think you know so much, write a book, and I was like, okay, I will, and uh, so I did, and you know, I look back on that, that was 15 years ago, which that hurts my heart to say, but uh, I look back on that, and I'm like, yeah, I still agree with most of, or much of this, but my approach has obviously, you know, evolved. I mean, it's interesting, because that book is basically you know, I wrote a book called The New Hermetics, in which I was sort of like trying to strip away a lot of the sort of unnecessary trappings of things um, and get to the point in consciousness. And your book is somewhat the same agenda, but without without the same, you know, <laughs> it's not the same book. Um, but but uh, you, it's the you, same you, sort of idea, yeah. what's that? It's the same sort of idea that. that yeah, exactly. The right. that has accrued. Right, even, exactly. Even in chaos magic, that was one of the things that kind of sent me away from chaos magic is a lot of stuff got stuck on it that I, I was like, well, this isn't the point. You know, there, there's a whole lot of stuff here that uh, there's a lot of like uh, metaphysical assumptions about materialism and stuff where it's like, I, I'm not buying this, you know. It's, I think people like to believe in something and to have something to sort of hang things upon. And so if you, if you, if you pull that away too much, people end up going like, well, where's the correct thing then? I, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a fright, which is probably why both of our books didn't do all that well in the marketplace. <laughs> you take away well, I, mean, I, I got some money from it and that was fine. That was fine. Um, it's out of print now. Um, I believe the e book version is still available, but the, um, 
the print version is out of print. I think it has it, it has a lot of interesting exercises that, that I haven't seen elsewhere and some exercises that I have seen uh, even in my own books uh, <laughs> are similar, you know, similar ones. But but I mean, a lot of the, a lot of it is quite, quite different, quite um, sort of stripped away of almost every sign of, of you know, occult you know, woo woo in it. It's really just about, you know, the universe and the world and the energies and the thoughts and the language and so, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's an interesting book. And it's, a, and, uh, and I like the fact that it's about, uh, that, it, that it's very sort of in the world, you know, you, you're, you're, it's, it's based in a practical space. Um, so th then you went on to write um, this book next, Magic Power Language yeah. Symbol. Yeah. And that one, I, in, in postmodern magic, I sort of talked around, not very effectively, but I talked around this idea that, that we keep talking about magic as energy, which mm -hmm. is this amorphous term that no one can seem to define very well because it's certainly sure. not physical energy. Um, and that comes with a whole bucket of metaphors that aren't really helpful, you know, because energy comes with scarcity, but there's no scarcity to magic. Um, and so I thought, well, a better metaphor for it now, not necessarily what it is, because who knows what it is, but a better metaphor for it was, you know, communication, information. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of what I tried to write in uh, uh, Magic Power Language Symbol. I always have to check what order those words go in. Right. Title. That's funny um, that you say that, because I feel that way about the book, too. Did you yeah. not create that title? Is that someone else's title? Or? No, uh, that, yeah, um, that, that was the publisher's title. I didn't have a very good title for it. And uh, they said, well, give me a bunch of words that <laughs> that you know evoke the sensation i gave him a bunch of words and they're like i think just those words would be great title. <laughs> you're the experts at marketing goodness knows i am not an expert in marketing that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting um revelation about that book i didn't realize that but, um so you you mentioned i think it's in postmodern magic you you talk about different paradigms for magic and i think that i think that um that it's not a unique idea i think that it's um what's his name the uh, the cast magic guy um carol he also he has a similar uh list of yeah. paradigms uh to yours which which one do you feel most closely identified with yourself well the i kind of it, it, it's traditionally called the information paradigm but i think of it as mm -hmm. the communication paradigm i think of magic as an act of communication um so so that being said um this brings us into like the territory of my uh my my sort of interview style here uh what do you think you are communicating with when you are when you're communicating with things because I, and I and i know in this book uh the divine mag art of divine magic the practical art of divine magic sorry, um you you mentioned that you have different views on different days that sometimes you see gods as being sort of uh, the laws of nature sometimes you see them as being inner forces and sometimes you see them as being you know discrete individuals so um what 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 do you generally consider yourself communicating with? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have that sort of cognitive flexibility to be able to see it in multiple ways. Um, you know, in I think it's in postmodern magic. I just call it the communicant because I don't know what it is. But I've gotten sort of a Neoplatonic bent um, as well, and I kind of think I think of it as sort of the noose. Mm -hmm. Or you know the anima mundi maybe the the, the animating soul of the world, um, um, and so in that regard it's like I'm I'm talking to the universe itself. I, oh God, that sounds so new agey, doesn't it? But it's it's in the literal sense that the universe is a conscious entity with a soul, and I'm talking to that soul. Um, at least that's one thing I think might be happening. But I, I, I think I, like mo the word new age, I think it's dead. I, I think it's it's purely a pejorative at this point. But uh, yeah. but I, but I think the ideas that, that come along with it, it's, I think I think it's a mistake for us all to just dismantle that and 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 say oh enough with that because there are lots of great ideas in there too. There are, but there are also pernicious ideas like the idea that we choose our karma and we're responsible for the suffering that happens to us. It certainly it certainly has a, a, a dark side to it for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. You you can you can you can put you can hurt yourself with that kind of thinking very easily for sure. Um, so, but the, so the, there's the the noose, which is the mind of of the universe or the the you know the entity, the great entity, the singularity, the all, whatever we want to call it. Um, 
but then there's the the beings that we work with in between and and that's i think where you're talking about neo, a neoplatonic kind of bent um right. what what functionally are those things to you are you are you interacting with gods and and, and angels and demons what are what, what are you doing when you're doing magic well i think of most of the practical magic I do, I think of as, as dealing with spirits, right? Uh, uh, daimonists in Greek, uh, mm -hmm. well, not not demons in the, the common sense of the word, of course, but that a daimon in daimon in uh, ancient Greek is just a uh, intermediary spirit, a spirit yeah. who conveys between humanity and the divine. Um, and they're not all good, of course, because the universe is not always nice to us. But uh, so I think I think a lot of what I do is is in that vein and so you know one of my influences now is uh, Aiden Wachter and uh, a lot of his work on like six ways and so forth um uh I've a lot of my magical practice especially right now right because I'm just right now I'm hunkered down you know what mm -hmm. <laughs> we all are what, what are we going to manifest right now right and we're not we're not meeting new friends or anything right now so a lot of my magical work right now is just maintaining and building that relationship of communication with the spirits. And I don't even always give them names. They don't even necessarily, you know, need names. They're just the spirits around that are helpful. And um, so, you know, on one level, it's that sort of like day-to-day -day practical spirits in the environment. Um, in another level, you know, I think there are gods. Um, what, what they are, like I said, I don't know for sure. I have different opinions on different days, but I think there's also communication with them. Uh, but I, I mean, I tend to think of the gods as not transcendent completely, but having a transcendent element where if, if you want love going directly to Aphrodite, like the transcendent Aphrodite, you know, the, the perfect goddess herself, um, seems a bit like overkill to me when there's plenty of daimones around who, who, serve her and might be willing to help. Although Plutarch points out that um, he says that a lot of times when people pray to a god, I think it's Plutarch who says this, uh, when people pray to a god, they're actually praying to a daimon of that god under the same name, which sure. I always thought was an elegant solution for, you know, if you want perfect gods who don't necessarily intervene in the universe, what does intervene? Their agents. So, so that's, I think that's what I'm communicating with. I mean that certainly makes sense with any in any kind of organizational structure. There's always going to be sort of the 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 people that you can actually get access to, or the beings you can actually get access to, and then those ones that are that are so far above you that you don't breathe the same air. Um, yeah. So, what what is the what, in, in your mind what is the purpose of that sort of relationship? Uh, you know, in, uh, the the art of divine magic is is. It's, it seems like it's it raising yourself to a higher level of consciousness. Is that? Um, I mean, the ultimate purpose is analysis. It's the, the experience of oneness with the universe, um, with uh, the, the realization that all the complex multifarious stuff going on is one thing, um, which isn't monotheism, right? It's monism, but monism is not monotheism because I'm not saying, well, then just pray to the one because how do you pray to the concept, how do you pray to yourself? You know, right. you, you're part of that. You're not part of it, you are it. Uh, if you're a part of it, there would be two. Uh, so it's it's having that sort of mystical experience, I think is the ultimate experience. And then it tends to make you, you know, on, on a practical level, it tends to make you a bit less of a jerk. Um, you know, I, I have softened a lot um, in the last, couple decades uh, just because I recognize that I am the things I'm mad at and now that again it kind of almost sounds new agey but it it's it's older than that all oh, right it's it's <laughs> goes back to Plato, if not before I think that's the challenge is that they're they they were reading the same books that that we read to a large yeah. extent and yeah. just coming up with a new way of phrasing it that fit with the modern world and so when we 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 end up saying the same things a lot of the time. Well, <laughs> the biggest challenge in talking about hypnosis is it's an experience of non-duality and language is inherently dualistic. Sure. If I say one word I'm not saying another word and that's what gives that word meaning that's not another word. And so the moment you try to put it in language or any other simple system, you're already not in a state of hypnosis. 
Um, and that's why, you know, that's why the experience is ineffable. And that's why it, you can't explain it completely. You can sort of allude to it or hint at it. You can do verbal tricks like the, the uh, via negativa, right? The, the saying everything that it's not. Right. Um, and then you're left with nothing, but that nothing is the one. And their duality, nothing one, right? It's, yeah. I guess it goes back to that, uh, yeah, I think it's the Golden Dawn equation, or is it? Uh, Crowley, is it the zero Crowley. equals two. Yeah, zero equals one, yeah. right? Um, I think he was kind of getting at something like that, but. Um, he had his moments. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. no, I, I, there's things that Crowley wrote that I like. Uh, I remember reading um, Magic Without Tears, uh, which I think is probably his best book for the casual reader anyway. Um, and he has, or was it, it actually might've been in Magic. Um, for book, you know, book four. Um, one or the other, he's talking about astral travel and he's like, it's very strange that I can't turn around in a circle when I'm outside of my body. And I wonder why that is. And I was like, I've had that same experience. I don't actually think I'm outside my body when I'm doing vision work, but, or, you know, journey work, but, um, cause I'm not sure what that would mean, but, um, but I've had the same experience, you know, you're, you're in an imaginative place and you're walking and you try to like, walk in a circle or turn around completely and you feel weirdly stuck. And I was like, yeah, he, he wasn't just talking about stuff he hadn't tried because he had tried that. You know? Oh no, for sure. I mean, he definitely was, was a person who had been exploring magic on a practical level, at least, you know, as much as, you know, most people who make that claim. Um, yeah. So well, more than most, I mean, Levy probably didn't try half the stuff he wrote about. Oh, I certainly. Yeah, yeah. Doubt about weight from time to time. But, Ian Kelly seemed to have done quite a lot of work. That was practical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually talk about them uh, uh, in this book. I talk about Enochian. Um, I noticed that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, and it, and it makes sense to talk about it in that context since it is it is largely based on a language that they that they mm -hmm. received or whatever. They. Uh, that's very strange. I I remember researching that for the book. Uh, you know, I had already read a lot about it, but then I actually got into like some of the original stuff. Um, uh, you know, but an account of what, what was it uh what passed among what passed between, yeah. <laughs> between two people or yeah, yeah. Some spirit. um so spirit. let's let's talk about what your work uh, as a magician looks like today uh, you know in in, in postmodern magic you give the impression that your your magic is pretty you know like you're just in a coffee shop and, <laughs> and you're you're receiving things is that does it still look like that has there been more formalism added to it or no I was thinking there's been less formalism than even that at this point. I mean, well, I mean, there, there is, I mean, I have, I have workspaces, I, I have material. I mean, you can see some of it around here, you know, this is my study. Um, I use stuff and I do stuff. Um, I don't, I no longer have, you know, the robes and the regalia and the circumambulations and so forth. I don't, um, but I've got some tools. Um, but a lot of what my day-to-day -day magic looks like is, Lighting a candle, lighting a stick of incense, pouring out a libation, saying hey to the spirits, not necessarily in those words, and uh, just going about my day. Um, I would say I'd. Well, there's this great, there's this great uh, concept, I don't know where it comes from, but of hot and cool magic. Have you heard of this before? No, yeah. no. Oh, uh, I think it's a traditional thing from some culture. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. But um, so the idea is there's, there's hot workings and there's cool workings. And the cool working sort of, I'm probably getting this wrong actually, but maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> it's okay, don't worry about anyway, it. Anyway. Um, just just the, say ca caveat, this is not, you're, yeah, you're speaking right. about your metaphor, not necessarily right. the original. Right. Right. So the, the cool stuff is, is the stuff that sort of just builds up your foundation. Mm. You know, um, it's like my neighbor snow blows my driveway um, when he does his regularly. And so sometimes I buy him a bottle of something nice and drop it off, you know? Um, it's that sort of relationship of friendliness mm -hmm. without expecting necessarily anything in return. But then every so often he calls me and says, hey, can you watch the cats while I go out of town? Right? And then I'm much more inclined to do that because I like him. Sure. Right? Um, and so a lot of my work, especially right now is that cool work. Most of my hot work, the stuff to actually get stuff done in the world is things like let's get my whole family vaccinated, you know. Let's let's do some apotropaic stuff just to protect everyone around me. Uh, and so, do you, the the cool work that you're talking about, 
um, that's sort of the the relational work of pouring out libations to various entities and and um, just sort of honoring them in your consciousness throughout the day. Do you yeah. feel like um, doing that sort of work makes you more conscious of your the way that you comport yourself in the world? <laughs> you know that that that. Uh, because there's a sense that like if you if you are asking things to be a part of your life uh, they're watching you at that point so do you do you feel like that uh, that adjusts your behavior yeah um like i said I, i'm i'm less of a jerk than i used to be i imagine my students if they heard that would think he is really <laughs> but i am less of a jerk than i used to be um not necessarily because i feel like i'm being watched but just because I, you know, I, I'm concerned about relationships. I'm concerned about other people and how they're doing, you know, um, whether those people are physical or not. I think you can take that too far. And sometimes what I see is people, um, like I've been asked, I think such and such a goddess is angry at me. What should I do? And I'm like, they're not, they're not angry at you. You know, uh, what you're feeling, you're feeling either you're angry at you and you're projecting it onto them or you've just not been keeping up the relation with them. So just go back and you know, pour out a libation and say hi again. That's all. So how do you how do you convince someone that you know that they that the goddess isn't angry at them? I mean, that, I have yet to manage to do that. People really want to cling to their fear, um, particularly of the gods. But I mean, my argument is uh, the gods are gods. You know, they're, right. they're, they're way above us. And, um, you know, even I'm just a human and, you know, I've had dogs before. And if the dog piddles on the carpet, you're like, oh, you, but you're not really angry. You just recognize, well, that's what dogs do. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're a bad dog. And then you go on and you're giving them scritches a few minutes later, right? But, um, and I'm just a human. So gods are better than I am. And if, if I can be that forgiving, I imagine gods can be even more forgiving, right? Um, they so, also probably have a pretty different perspective because they're, they've are they been around for a long time and watching people come and go pretty quickly <laughs> from, yeah. their, from their scale of time. Yeah. What we do couldn't seem all that important to them. I think a lot of people read into mythology as if it's scripture. Uh, they, sure. they, they come to mythology with that idea that scripture ha has to be 100% true. And I don't think mythology is even 5% true. I think it's symbolically true. I think it reflects truths potentially, but um, I don't think gods are running around trying to hurt people. Uh, now, that I, I think there are probably spiritual entities who are hostile, um, but I, I don't think that's a major concern for most people. And so those hostile spiritual entities or even unhostile spiritual entities, where do you see them residing? You know, what how, what is their functional connection with us in in this plane? Are they? Um, in, I, I mean, in I'm an gonna... astral plane, or are they? I mean, you know, when when uh, let me ask, let me let me put it this way: um, you, you you've done some scrying and, and visionary work and journeying and so forth. Where are you going, and, and what what is the what is the channel of communication between you and whatever beings you're communicating with in that space? That's a really good question, um, and I don't have a real good answer to it. I don't know that there is an astral plane in the sense of a world on top of this one. I mean, I've written about it, but I'm not 100% convinced that that's that's what's there. Um, I'm more convinced that the physical world is a reflection of something, like the tip of an iceberg. And that it's not that the, there's an astral plane separate from the physical world, but the physical world is the, the froth on top of something much more complex uh, that is filled with its own entities that just have never you know, broached the surface of, of physicality. Um, I guess are those entities like drinking coffee with their buddies and then they and then they're oh Patrick is calling. Okay. <laughs> hey gonna... Patrick, what's going on? I wrote an essay about this years and years ago, and I think it's been long lost now. Um, but um, so, you know, if you put yourself in the place of a being that has never had a body, mm -hmm. it would not have any of the embodied metaphors that we use to think about the world, right? We think up is more because we have the embodied experience of piling things on top of each other, so there's more of them. You know, we think um, 
uh, light is good, dark is bad. We think um, uh, uh, up is live, down is dead. You know, we have all these metaphors based on our experience in a body. If you never had a body, you have none of those metaphors. And so you also have no sense of space because there would be no need of a sense of space if you don't have a body. Um, you have no sense of need, like you're not gonna starve to death. You know, you're not gonna experience hunger. Hunger is a great metaphor for all sorts of human desires. So your desires are gonna be different. So to be a spiritual entity would mean to be something extremely alien to our experience. So I don't think they're sitting around drinking coffee in, in you know, the astral Starbucks um, because I don't think there's a place for them to be. I think they're, they're not, I mean, there, there are spirits of place, but I don't think that there are, that spirits are like, I, you know, I don't think if, if I do a goetic summoning of Buer, I don't think he, he's going, oh God, I have three goetic summonings right now. And then I have to get off to Illinois. I'm sorry, I just made Siri very mad at me. Um, to get off to Illinois and see, see Patrick, you know, um, I don't think that's happening. Um, I don't know that that answered your question. No, I mean, sure. it, it answered it. it, it I, I think, you know, it, well enough for me to understand kind of where you're coming from, I think. So yeah. when when we call to a spiritual entity, they they hear us because they're not somewhere else or here. They're just being this, correct? Is that is that what yeah, basically that's, what? that's what I, I think is likely the case. Like the, their attention is diffuse throughout the universe. Probably most spirits, well, except maybe spirits of place, but even spirits of place, I think probably to some degree have that sort of diffuse attention throughout the universe. Um, and so the, the the trick is to learn to like get their attention, and that's what you know the offerings and stuff are for. Uh, right now, there's a there's a, a number of different sort of trends going on in the magical community, but one of the ones that seems very noticeable to me is there are a lot of people who are very concerned about you know the, a, a manuscript that was discovered in a library in you know Vienna that offers a different word in this place in in the grimoire and which one is correct and this one's older so it must be correct and yada 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 how do you how do you see the 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 power of um sort of the formulas of magic as how, how is that relevant to the pursuit of communicating with spirits and so forth um, I mean, the people doing that work are my kind of nerd, so I, I'm 100%. I'm not objecting to their to their doing it, but I mean functionally but within... Functionally, within the... I don't do a lot of grimoire stuff. Uh, not anymore, really. Um, and I think, I mean, I see the argument that following this formula that has been time-tested might, you know, drive a groove it's that spirit's experience. And so, you know, if I you know, pick up the Goetia and start reading it. Um, the spirit might go, oh yeah, he's doing that thing they do when they, when they want to talk. Um, but I don't really do that so much anymore. I mean, for one thing, I don't really name the spirits that much anymore unless they come to me and give me a name. Um, so you don't work with any named spirits? You no, know, I, from... I work with some, but for the most part, no, most, for the most part, they're just, you know, the spirits that help me. Um, would, would you be more likely to go to the Greek magical papyri, or would you be more likely to go to uh, just sort of a freeform behavior? Like, where, where, where do you sort of draw your magical sustenance from? I, I steal from the Greek magical papyri from time to time, although that, that's a fun book to play with, because it'll be like a perfectly reasonable spell, and then in the middle of it, it'll be like, and then, you know, have a priest of Isis sacrifice a chicken, right. and it's like, well, that's not going to happen. Um, not anytime soon. Uh, but I, you know, I'll, I'll take formulas and stuff from there, but a lot of times it's just speak extemporaneously, or I, I'm kind of a fan of glossolalia. Um, a lot of times in my work, I just fall into glossolalia. Do you think that that's kind of what's being represented in some places in Greek magical papyri, where there's like all these long sequences of, of vowel sounds, or do you think that that's more intentional than that? I'm not sure from an academic perspective why that's there. Some of it is some of it is Coptic, you know, some of it is just badly transliterated Coptic into mm -hmm. Greek. Um, but some of it, like the long vowel sounds, 
I mean, I, I, I have played with the notion that they might represent musical tones. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to transcribe music. I've actually written some songs based on vowel sequences in the Greek magical papyri. But I have no idea historically if that's the case. I just know that the vowels were associated with musical tones. Have you have you composed anything that sounds like music from those? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's weird. You know, it's modal and strange. But um, yeah, uh, I should really I should probably type that up into Muse Score or something so I could share it. Some, yeah, someday. that would be that would be great. Uh, which yeah. way do you go with the 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 musical tones? Where where, where do you associate with with the vowels? Um, I put. No, I can't remember. I think I, yeah, I went with alpha at the moon. And so uh, alpha is low. Yes, alpha is low. And then I go up to omega being. being uh, that's, that's the way I did. I actually have some recordings that have vowel sounds at different tones that, uh, that, I, that I did that way. And oh, I went okay. with Paul Foster Case's version of the, um, the scale just because it was there. And it's it's also used, I think, in some theosophical circles, that exact same sequence of things. So it seemed so like- does he, does he use a regular, like, is he writing modally or? He has, well, no, he start, he, he has the, basically the, you know, the major, the, the C scale is associated with the planets essentially, so. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I used a mode and I can't remember which one, I think it was the Lydian mode. Um, hmm. Much, but... much more technical and, and uh, um, uh, scholarly than. <laughs> well, I, when, when I'm tired of words, I, I, which I am by the end of the day, then I'd like to go and compose and play music. I'm not very good at playing it, but I'm, it's fun to compose it, so. What sort of music do you compose? Um, well, I'm actually working on a sequence of three songs based on uh, three pagan heroes, um, uh, Antinous, Hypatia, and Julian. So. I'm halfway through the Hypatia movement. And do you, do you offer this music to the world or is it just something that you have? Mostly it's just for fun at this point, but I think I probably will uh, make this available on Facebook or something to, to friends. I mean, you should, people would, I'm sure people would want to hear it. I can't, I can't say whether they'd like it or not because I haven't heard it. <laughs> <laughs> I've also tried sending some of the Orphic hymns to music. Um, and I did get one that, that some local musicians actually recorded. I, I've I've wondered that about those hymns in particular for a very long time because of the fact that Orpheus is a musician, and uh, and like not only a musician but a musician who is so fantastic that he can make animals calm and he can get out of Hades and you know like his music is pretty fantastic and to like call something Orphic hymns and not have it be musical seems almost like it's disjointing uh you know like quite where, what <laughs> so have, so yeah. which which hymns have you put set to music i set the hymn to hecate to music um oh i wanted to talk to you with you about that because uh you you make note of the fact that um you know thomas taylor does not make that a part of the um the orphic hymns and it, it what why do you think that is is that it just a well choice? he includes it the yeah, languages, well, he, yeah, it's it's at the end yeah. of the hymn to Museus or whatever. Right, but. right. Um, I, I mean, the, there are no, well, that's not entirely true that there are no headings. I think in the original manuscript, the heading for the hymn to Akate is missing. Mm. And so, um, so he doesn't include it. Did I mark that with a note? I, I think you to, do have a note on the subject, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he doesn't include it, I think, just because the heading is missing. But I, I think pretty much everyone... Yeah, yeah, it's in brackets. So I think pretty much everyone agrees that there, that was a, a hymn to, to Hakate there. Cause I mean, it just changes dramatically from- Sure, it stays with one one person yeah. for a while as opposed yeah, to- Yeah, whereas previous, it's just lifting every god he can think of. Right, yeah. Um, so how much do the, the Orphic hymns play a part in your sort of, you know, workaday magical life? Um, fairly large part. Uh, but also, you know, a lot of my magic is thergic. Um, so when, when, you know, I use them as speech offerings. Uh, so if I'm doing an offering to, you know, Dionysus, for example, I'll uh, read an Orphic hymn to Dionysus, make the offering, make my prayer. Um, so, but I mean, I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm an Orphic, you know. Um, what, what's your expected conclusion from doing that activity? Like you, you, 
you make the offering and you and you uh, recite the prayer and then you make your own contemporary or spontaneous prayer after that or yeah and is your intention to raise your consciousness towards Dionysus or you know what is what is right. the purpose right so to create a, a stronger relationship with Dionysus and as as you said sort of you know make my conscience congruent with with his um for a moment you know so um so what is that experience like from a you know from a practical perspective? What's what's happening? Do you it depends, feel... on, depends on the God, right? Um, with Dionysus, it's a it's kind of a way to put down worries. Um, you know, he's the liberator, he's the freer. Mm -hmm. So after a hard day, um, instead of, instead of taking a shot of alcohol, I'll pray to the God of alcohol. You know, um, uh, and but so... also. Like I, I, I work with, you know, Hakate as well, and I'll, I'll do that and then maybe go on and do some practical magic with the idea that, okay, I've, I've plugged into the, I plugged, you know, into the socket up here. I've got, oh, there's that energy metaphor again, right? But right. I've got- yeah. It's uh, hard to get away from it in our modern era. <laughs> but, you know, but that, with the idea that, you know, she's might be standing behind me, giving me a hand. And, yep. Um, if nothing else, my mind is at least attuned to, you, to her. Sure. And um, but so when you're doing these theurgical works in particular, um, is there a is there a visionary component to it? Do you feel like you're you know, the, 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 is there a presence of, of the divine or are you just simply trying to enter into the divine? Sometimes there's a there's a sense of presence. Um, I think people get hung up on that. But one of the things I've noticed after writing that Book on Thurgy is, you know, so I'll talk to people online sometimes and they'll get very hung up that they're very concerned that they're not feeling the presence. And I think that's problematic. I think it's it's okay not to have an immediate result, mm -hmm. you know, um, even with the spirit. Like I've done, I've done uh, evocations of spirits uh, uh, from the Arbitel, which is the one grimoire I still kind of use a lot. Um, and I won't always get a sense of the spirit's presence, but I just bowl on anyway. And then often what I ask for happens. So just the, just the fact that you're not perceiving the presence doesn't mean there's not something happening under the surface of your perception. Uh, you, and then when people obsess about it, worry about it and get anxious about it. I think that's really detrimental. Anxiety is detrimental, I think, to effective magic. I, I would say that I couldn't agree more. If you go up on stage to play music and you don't play your instrument properly and you just think about whether the audience hates you or not the whole time, you're not going to play very good music. Um, so uh, do you think that, that that more sort of either energetic or imaginal or w whatever presence that you might experience from, from a magic block, do you think that that comes with more experience or do you think that that sort of just sort of comes and goes randomly for you and and for anyone else that you can speak for um well i can really only speak for myself but um it i think there's so many factors that go into it you know there's my mood there's what i've eaten today there's how well i've slept and so i don't know that it's random but it might as well be in terms of being able to trace why why I'm getting a vision and why I'm not getting a vision. And, you know, I, I mean, on the whole, I've probably had fewer religious experiences than, than some people, or certainly fewer than people claim. Um, and that's okay, you know, that uh, sometimes people talk about the gods like they're coming over for tea. And that's not really my experience with them. Um, I think when, if I were to have that experience of like, you know, I call on a god and there they are. I would begin to doubt that I'm not projecting something from myself in the shape of a god because that seems almost facile, you know. Uh, so you you don't regularly have sort of any sort of visionary experiences with them, like a, a presence uh, that's even in your imagination of the. I, I have, but I wouldn't say regularly, and I don't necessarily strive to have them. But you know, I I have. There, there are moments where, like, one, one of the things I talk about in one of my books is you, you, you imagine the image of the god in mm -hmm. front of you, and then at some moment that image moves 
or acts without you necessarily directing it to do that. Yeah. And that that happens, you know, and when that happens, it's usually fairly significant. It usually means something. Um, so, you know, I've had, well, while praying, I've had that, that imaginal image of the deity that I'm praying to um, hold up something, for example. And uh, it's usually a significant object that is giving me some insight into what I'm praying for. Uh, sometimes I have no idea what it means. Uh, like when I, when I was on the job market back in 2005, I uh, did a working with a spirit to, to, to get a job. And it seems like a lot of my magic is to get jobs. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> really Especially like, since you just said you don't really like jobs. So. <laughs> I, like, I like my current job. I love, I love. <laughs> that's uh, good. Yeah. Uh, that's good. But, um, so I did, I did that working and uh, I saw the image of the spirit holding a silver tray with little rings of quicksilver. Like they were rings, but they were obviously a quicksilver. They were like flowing around each other. And I, I to this day, I don't know what that meant. Um, what was the I, next job you got though? But the, then I got the job, yeah. This, so, job, this job? Yeah. So- Where you're you constantly developing the quicksilver of, of young people's minds. I guess maybe, it, maybe it's an alchemy reference. Maybe that's what it is. Or, or Quicksilver also drives you mad. So maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> You've been eating your rings. Mm. Uh, so um, it seems like a, a practical magic plays a significant role in your life, but just at, at intervals. And, but mostly you're, you're doing theurgical work. And yeah, I, I go through periods of doing a lot of practical magic. And then I run into the situation where I have everything I want. Um, you know, and so there's, there's not much else to do except maintenance, you know, mm -hmm. magic for maintaining health, maintaining relationships, stuff like that. Um, but then something comes up that I want, that I need, you know, uh, pandemic hits and I have to protect myself and others, you know, things like that. Sure. Um, so yeah, it, it, it used to bug, I actually used to kind of worry about that, about like, I haven't done magic in months other than, you know, my offerings. Um, but I think you get at a point where when it's working for you, a lot of it is going on underneath the hood, you know, underneath consciousness anyway. I want to talk for a second about uh, caromancy because you wrote, you wrote a book on it from a, from a semiotic perspective. And I find that really interesting. It's, it's the only one of your books that I've never even seen. So <laughs> I can't, I don't, I have no expertise uh, on what the subject of the matter is. So tell me about your semiotic approach to, to the tarot and, uh, I can't. I'm not even gonna say say it again. I've already forgotten. I told you. Lenormand. Lenormand. Um, um, tell you about it. Okay. So, sure. so I read the tarot fairly regularly as, on a professional yeah. level. I I do. You know, I, I I have clients who I do readings for. Um, mostly I try and keep it. Um, light and fun so I really don't want a bunch of clients writing to me and saying they want <laughs> but but so anyway uh so I mean I utilize the tarot as a tool pretty constantly what is your approach to um you know doing doing card readings what are your beliefs about it and and what, what you know what what did you put in that book to to tempt me to buy yet another one of your books um I I think that my approach is kind of holistic to, to card reading. It's not formulaic, which a lot of Lenormand readers prefer a more formulaic approach. Um, well, I don't know that I want to say it that way, but they prefer, Lenormand is much more straightforward than tarot in a lot of ways. Like one card usually means one or two things. Um, so the card dog, for instance, means a friend or loyalty, uh, maybe a helper. Um, Sometimes it actually literally means a dog, by the way. But, but a friendly. But not, yeah, but it's not like, um, you know, the tarot, the tower means everything's falling down, that's awful. It means old structures are being removed. It means uh, you're in a war with someone, you're, you're in a siege, you're falling down, you know, a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, so the Lenormand is more narrow in terms of the semiotic space covered by each card, but that means that the combinations of cards become much more important. Mm -hmm. Because then it's like, okay, if you have, oh, I don't know, um, mouse, mouse means small loss, disease, a little worry, right? 
So if you have mouse and dog together, does that mean that you're going to lose a friend? So it's like, you know, loss of a friend. Um, so kind of what I write about is how, how to think in terms of the, those symbols and in the sort of like topic comment structure. Like th this, this is a topic of a thing. This card is a comment on that thing. Um, and can that go back and forth either way with those cards? Yeah, or, or? That's, that's the problem with Leonard Mond because sometimes it's hard to tell which one is the topic and which one is the comment. Mm -hmm. um, there are readers who, well, there are actually traditional orders that are important. So for example, the card Scythe is cutting off the thing that is on the side of the blade. Mm. So if you lay down the scythe and then dog, now you're definitely losing a friend. That's the loss of a friend, possibly the death of a friend, right? Um, um, but so but if you, you see, let's say, scythe, that's your friend cutting off whatever's coming after the scythe. But let, okay, so you see a you see a scythe, or you get the scythe, and then you get the dog, and then you get the mouse. What does that mean? Uh, loss of you're going to worry about the loss of a friend, I would think. Yeah, that would be my guess anyway. But uh, again, another thing I talk about is context still matters and quite the question matters. Um, so if you're asking about a court case, you're probably not too concerned about the loss of a friend. That might mean that there the dog might represent, you know, a helper, your lawyer. And there it might mean you need to get a new lawyer, right? Uh, so in, in my, my way of looking at the tarot um, is that it, it's kind of like a, there's a, there's four pieces of, of what's going on. There's, the, um, the, the, what the cards sort of have as a presentation, there is the, the connection between them, you know, the symbol, then the connection between them. And then my sort of way of interpreting that uh, generally, and then the person who's sitting in front of me, you know, that, that but that person is, is a very important part of the reading for me. And I would, I think I would be very, I would kind of be confused by having a super simple set of symbols because that it, there's less space for that final relationship with the person who's in front of you because there's, um, you know, that, uh, like, it seems like there's more place to go wrong is basically, you know, like, it's, it's easier to get off the track. So um, how do you manage that with, with those cards? Well, one of the things I talk about in the book is actually using both cards at the same time. Mm. So doing a tarot card reading for that sort of, you know, um, I guess, cosmic wisdom on the situation. And then the Lenormand to say, okay, what does that look like on the ground? Um, Do you think they're, the, they're more of a practical card? I, I, I always think of them as a more practical card. And you know, their history that they started as a card game, just like the tarot, although it was mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a chase game. It was like a board game, but you laid out the cards as the board. And um, they weren't taken terribly seriously, just like the tarot wasn't, you know, it was just a way to pass the time and play. Um, and so one of the things I point out in the book is the, the life world of, you know, the 19th century noble or 19th century uh, a woman of leisure, who would be the person probably playing with these cards. Mm -hmm. They were very gendered, you know, women did this, men didn't do it. Um, uh, that life world is much more similar to our life world than the life world represented by the tarot cards, right? I mean, sure, uh, but I it's still, it's still very different. It's still, you know, like the, there's there's a card letter in the letter mod that means a message. Well, we're more likely to get an email now than a letter, right? Which is a minor thing, but so you have to be aware that the meanings are going to shift over time. Uh, and so, I, I mean, it would seem that those cards would be particularly interesting to you as a person who's very interested in semiotics and and uh, you know the general study of of that that sort of symbolic language. That's why I got into them. When I discovered them, I was like, this is a semiotic gold mine. Um, and at the time, there were relatively few resources on the Lenormand, but they exploded since then in popularity in America. They were very popular in Europe, but not so much in America. So a lot of the books were in French or in um, uh, Spanish, uh, both of which I kind of read, so that helps. But now they're, they're, the popularity is so, there's so many books on the Lenormand now mm -hmm. that were there when I wrote my book. And I almost want to go back and <laughs> rewrite it. Edit know? it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> there's, oh, I've edited it a lot. Do a whole new edition, but I don't know that I'm going to do that. I have other problems. There's definitely some clunkers in everything I've written too, so I know the feeling. Where it's like, oh, yeah. It's, well, it's just, I, it would be wonderful to have more resources. You know that, especially now that the American tradition of Leonard Mom has started to pick up, 
and there's there's traditions of interpretation. There's the South American tradition of interpretation. There's the French tradition of interpretation. And one of the things I talk about in the book is there's this emerging American version of interpretation mm -hmm. that's to get more popular in America. Well, it's not emerging anymore. It's there, you know, and it'd be really cool to explore that more more in depth. But like I said, I have so many other projects. I don't know that I'll ever get to that. Sure. Well, I mean, it still sounds like an interesting book, even if it if it mm -hmm. has some, you know, minor things that you might shift immediately thing, and some major right. things that you might add <laughs> ultimately. Oh yeah, I think I think if I were to write this now, it'd be three times the size because there's just so much more material. So now I want to get to the 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 questions related to this that some of my viewers find fascinating and others of my viewers find annoying. But so, um, what <laughs> what do you think is happening when you are doing? Um, Sortilage and cardomancy. Like, what what is the what is the process that's underway there? Well, I think it's an act of communication between yourself and the anima mundi, the spirit um, of the world, the soul yeah. of the world. Yeah, um, I think it's a connection with that through through randomness, uh, randomness. You know, it 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 it, it always stuns me because I because I do readings at, at places where. A lot of the people I'm doing a reading for have never had a reading ever in their life before, and they almost always walk away going, "I really thought that was just going to be a bunch of crap, but that was so meaningful to me. I can't believe it, Jason. I mean, that just happens so frequently. And I don't even—I'm not saying that I'm the greatest tarot reader in the world or anything like that, but just it, there's so much meaning to be found in those things that um, it, it, it it never ceases to amaze me how how quickly you can convert someone from like diehard skeptic. Um, I recently had a woman who was a uh, sociologist, I think, and she she was not convinced even through it because she was she was very much looking at it through her own filters and was not willing to step past that. But Well, even in my skeptical moments, I think there's a lot of value in seeing patterns in, in randomness because mm -hmm. the pattern you see will tell you something about what's going on in your unconscious, if not something bigger than that. And so, you know, even a pure skeptic can get something out of Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you can't help it because we are speaking language to each other. That's what I say to skeptics. I say, listen, this is about communication between you and I, and I'm going to say a bunch of words, and you're going to hear what you hear, and some of it's going to be meaningful to you on some level, and you can just discard the rest. Um, the the thing that troubles me about um, uh, divination in general and professional diviners is that so frequently the people who are engaged in it do not realize the power of what it is that they're doing and the fact that they are having an intensely magical moment with this person. And I hear people saying just such disturbing things, you know, to, to people about their souls and this, and, you know, that they'll never have this happen in their life or this sort of stuff. And it's just, it, it, it boggles my mind that someone can enter into a field with so little heart in themselves that they would be willing to damage another person in that way. Because I mean, you go to a psychic of any sort, even at like a, a you know, a, a flea market or something, you're, that's going to live with you for years, if not your entire life. It may be a turning point moment in your life to see that person. And, uh, you know, you're, you're essentially Merlin for that person, you know, giving this, this advice from the cosmos. And, and like, I don't understand why people take it so unseriously. I mean, I, that being said, I try and be fun with people when I'm doing it, but like, I don't, just don't get how people can misunderstand what's going on. And I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about because you understand language and the fact that if I say to you, you're never going to achieve greatness or you know, you, oh, that no. was the love of your life and it's over for you now. That's just like, that's an insane thing to communicate to a person. Well, 80% of what I do, I think in, in most readings, not that I do them for money anymore, I used to, but I don't anymore. Um, but about 80% of what I did was just help them come up with a better question. Mm -hmm. and help them frame their experience in a question that didn't like people would ask am i ever going to find love and i'd say well let's talk about what you could do to increase your chances of finding love you know what are the things you can work on with yourself uh how where, where are you most likely to meet people who are like you let's see if we can divine that because if like you said the never word is just dangerous mm -hmm always and never. I mean, that's all or nothing thinking. That's, that's a cognitive distortion that leads to all sorts of depression. And it's not, uh, people, people should have a little more sense of responsibility uh, when they're trying to give people advice, it seems to me, even if they're not giving advice with tarot cards, 
But like you said, when you add when you add in the magical element, now definitely you want to have some ethical standards. Yeah, and just and just uh, uh, kindness standards. Like you know, everything that you're doing should be in some way to inspire them to be happier than they are at this moment. <laughs> or why are you there to make yeah. them feel worse? <laughs> Which doesn't mean that, you know, if you see bad news in the cards that you don't say it, but, no. but there's ways of saying that, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between this is a disaster coming and uh, you're going to have some challenges and here's, let's see if we can divine some ways for you to cope with those right. challenges. And prepare yeah, for them. But there's a challenge. Let's see if you can be ready for the solution. What are the, what are yeah. these other cards around here say that might be part of that solution that you're having? I'm very much about it empowering the querent rather than just laying out the cards and getting paid. So is that, is that present in your book or no? That, that I aspect talk about the importance of the framing the question. And mm. I mean, every, every book on tarot talks about the importance of framing the question, but I don't think all of them recognize exactly how important it is because uh, I know a lot of people who frame really terrible. I mean, you know, you, I've lurked on Facebook groups about tarot, mostly lurked. And uh, the things you see sometimes uh, that people have asked the cards and then they're very concerned they're very worried they're very anxious again there's that anxiety and so what's, well, a, what's an example of the kind of thing you don't have to name oh, a specific yeah I'm just... to, let me see if i can fictionalize something that is similar to the sorts of things i've seen um uh well like does so and so love me mm, yeah or or are they cheating on me oh yeah <laughs> or actually the one that always gets me and i've seen this more than once am i pregnant <laughs> like there's a drugstore on the corner <laughs> with a relatively inexpensive test <laughs> go use that <laughs> well it, it's been wonderful talking to you patrick but I'm, I'm pretty sure we're over our our uh, allotted time here so i'm gonna i'm gonna um wind this down i would actually love to talk to you again in the future because there's you know you you you've written some stuff that I think really I'd, I'd like to talk about more. Like for instance, I noticed that you've got some stuff about sacred geometry in this book. And I mean, there's just, there, there's so much that we could talk about. Um, and so this was the introduction, hopefully <laughs> to another conversation yeah. in the future. Uh, and uh, just real quick, I've been asking people to do this lately. If you could give one piece of advice to someone who is just getting started in magic right now, what, what would you say to them? Uh, start simple find one small practice that you can do every day, but don't beat yourself up if you miss a day, but one small practice you can do every day, even if it's just meditating for five minutes and, and start with that as your base. Don't try to take on, don't try to learn everything. Don't try to take, take on everything at once. Just find one little thing you can do on a regular basis and build from there. That would probably be my advice. Um, people get overwhelmed very easily with magic. For sure, especially since there's so many different uh, ways in which it can go. <laughs> so, um, so we've already my, talked my other advice would be uh, avoid anxiety. Yeah, try try to try not to feed your anxiety with your magic. So I gave two pieces of advice that gives me extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, what would be an example of of feeding anxiety? We know we talk about one thing. What's what's what, what else do you mean by that? Superstition. Um, I see sometimes people get really panicked about how their candles burn. Mm -hmm. Candles just burn weird sometimes. It's not necessarily a problem unless there's any some other indication that there's something that's gone wrong with the spell. Probably just means your, your heater came on and blew the candle strangely. Um, you know, don't, don't, or, or their candle holder cracked while they were doing a candle magic spell. Well, they do that sometimes. That's why you don't leave them unattended. Um, but then people will get very nervous about it and think that they're in dire danger. And they're not, unless they leave the candle unattended, then they're in dire danger, but it's not magical, it's physical. Thank <laughs> you.